I'm going to start by just putting climate change in strategic context for the business. We've got something called Plan A, a 100-point sustainability plan we launched in January 2007. It's nearly three years old now, another couple of years to go to, to finish it. 29 of those 100 commitments about climate change, and that's what I'm going to focus on today. But the key message I'm going to start with is that if you look at Marks and Spencer's financial report, not our sustainability book report, but Marks and Spencer's corporate financial report, we've got five platforms for growth we talk about there, the board talk about. Growing our food business, our clothing business, our international business, our online business. And fifth, and hopefully not least, is Plan A. And we've got a very clear rationale for growing the Mark and Spencer business model success of the next decade using Plan A. And carbon is it, a, a significant part of that. So look at that report, imagine that report. That's where we start from. It's worth saying before we dive into the world of carbon, though, there are 71 other commitments in there that are not about climate change, ostensibly. And I will not walk away from the fact that we need to tackle raw materials, waste, people, two million people in our supply chain, and health. So as much as and the hard as we Your work in carbon... Please. The fire alarm has now been tested. Any further activation should be treated as alarm event. Thank you. Fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> OK. So... Just remember that whatever we do on climate change needs to be set in that context. There's 71 other things that we're committed to doing. Now, there's some double wins in there. There's some things you can do for waste that helps you on carbon, raw materials that helps you for carbon. Now, the first thing I'm going to show you is a slide that we took to the MS board about two months ago. And it just sets in context that we've got something called Plan A, 100 commitments that MS is working hard on, but we've come from somewhere and we're going somewhere after Plan A. Now, on this axis is just how sustainable we think Mark and Spencer is. It's just Mike's view, it's not scientific, 0%, 100%. Along the bottom is just time elapsed. We used to do something called corporate social responsibility. Uh, like a lot of retailers, we got reasonably good at it. It was about risk management, you didn't want a, a nasty child labour scandal on the front page of, your, of The Guardian. Equally, you wanted to exploit a few opportunities to tell the MS difference, all our coffee and tea, fair trade, all, all our eggs free range. Some nice stories. But realistically, it was just cherry-picking certain issues that had particular risk or particular opportunity for the business. There's no real business case. It's all about reputation. It was pretty well managed on the edge of the business. 2006, MS reasonably good at it. Growth comes into the business, kicks things on. I want something more, more ambitious. It drives us to launch Plan A. Key me message number one from this graph is look at the rate of acceleration now. We were sort of chugging, chugging along, getting a little bit more sustainable. Now we've been driven much harder to drive that sustainability journey. What makes Plan A different from CSR? Firstly, it's about tackling all the issues systemically. There's nothing, I believe, that we've missed in the two and a half years, or nearly three years since we launched Plan A, there's virtually nothing, well, nothing, nobody's come to me and said, you missed an issue. We're tackling all 100 that are relevant to us. Some of those issues we're good at, already good at, we've got better. Some of those issues, frankly, we were not even, we were amongst the worst in our industry. Too much packaging, we had to tackle it. So, Plan A is about tackling everything systemically across our whole value chain. I'll show you the MS value chain in a moment. But it's also, above all, about driving a business case to underpin our future growth as a business. But it's also about being humble. I do believe Mark and Spencer is amongst the top 30 or 40 companies in the world grappling with this issue. But you know what? At best, we've done 10% of the journey. 10% along the axis. Ahead of us lies 90% of the journey to build a sustainable business model. It's tough. Beyond Plan A, what we've got to start thinking about in 2012 is something we call how we do business, HWDB. It's about driving a different culture in the business. This is about saying that everybody owns Plan A as a starting point for their thinking. So rather than having a 100-point plan and me going along and saying, do your three bits of it, and everybody's saying, yes, boss, we'll do, do those three bits, this is about saying, think sustainably. You might not even need a plan by then. You just think, how can I be a more sustainable buyer of ready meals, running of lorries, running of an IT operation? It's about bringing different culture into the business. And you know what? It's going to take us 10 years to deliver that across every nook, cranny, and process and person in the M&S business model. And then there's that middle of the start of it, because beyond then, it's about building a truly sustainable business model, which is what none of us have today. So we might just get iteratively better over the next five, ten years. Great. We change the culture of the business. Great. But how we sell products and services in 2020, I strongly contend, will look very different from what it is in 2010. So that's the context that we must see carbon within. 
Just a few numbers about the MS value chain. We're relatively small as a retail, 35,000 product lines, a couple of thousand factories, 20,000 farms, 2 million workers in the supply chain. We sell 350 million garments, 2 billion items of food. Every single aspect of that is covered by Plan A and 100 commitments. As much as we've got a policy and a strategy job, we've just got a sheer organisational job to drive change across that value chain. There's retailers in the UK five times bigger than me. You multiply that, those numbers by five to get a scale, a feel for the scale of their challenge. And what is that challenge? This is what MNS does. We drive a carbon footprint of 6.3 million tonnes of CO2 equivalent, approximately 1% of all the emissions from the UK economy. And I'm just a shop, and I've got my hands on that level of carbon footprint. There are just a few numbers, again, about the rest of Plan A, the water footprint, the timber footprint, the cotton footprint of our business. I could go on. There's a huge amount for us to change and improve. What is the business case for Plan A? Why are we doing it, and why we kept doing it in a recession? It's both profoundly important, but also in some sense it's very simple. Nothing that you don't know, nothing that you're probably not doing in your own business. Customer, I'm going to talk, show you a quick slide in a moment about where MS customers are. They expect us to be tackling this. Secondly, efficiency. We've got a cost base of at least five billion quid that we spend across the world buying stuff. We buy products to sell to customers, we buy IT kit, lorries, stores to run our business. I would estimate that 10% of that five billion is environmental and social cost. Now, lots of it's legitimate. I need energy. I need water. I generate some, I've got to generate waste to handle. But there's an awful lot I can save from that cost base if I do the right thing environmentally and socially. Motivation for the troops, 75,000 employees at MS. It's been a bit tough in retail the last 18 months. It'll be tough for the year or so ahead. This gives them a lot of reason to be proud about working for Mark and Spencer. And then perhaps the most important one. Whatever is happening today in recession, by 2015, 2020, the pressures upon my business model in terms of what I can do will be immense. Now, whatever the price of carbon may be, whatever the constraints on where in the world I source from because of climate change, whatever the campaigning, there will be challenges upon me. But above all, there will be opportunity. Marks and Spencer started selling energy. A couple of hundred thousand customers recruit already in a few months. Part of the proposition for selling energy is it can encourage people to use less. It's a good service model. It's a good uh, value for money model but also help you do the plan A thing at home as well by driving down your actual energy use yourself. That's just the tip of a very, very, very interesting iceberg for Mark and Spencer and a lot of businesses to explore. Just because there's a recession on today doesn't mean I'm not going to be planning for the future. Customer, very, very quickly. Along the top is the UK population. Along the bottom is the subset that's 21 million MS customers. Far end, don't care. Mainly driven by poverty, people getting by on benefit each week aren't too worried about climate change. Why would they be? I wouldn't be. About a, quarter, about a fifth of the British population of the MS uh, customer base. 10% passionate Green Crusaders. The two groups in the middle are the most important, both for me commercially and also for British society, if it's going to become sustainable. If it's easy, light green, very positive. Concerned about these issues, want something to happen, want to contribute, but want it to be easy. I'm going to go out of the way to do it. I'm going to pay more for it, but if it's put on the plate for them, they'll join in. And then this th third group here, what's the point? Quite cynical on the surface, what's the point? You know, I, I change a light bulb, do some recycling, a billion people in China swamp it. What was the point of doing something? I just feel a bit of a fool. What the group's actually saying in focus groups to us, if they feel part of a tribe for change, each doing one small thing across a million people, and those million small changes add up to a big whole, that's, that wasn't too bad, that was easy. So what are those tribes in people's lives? Well, people belong to the WI, they belong to a particular religion, they belong to a particular football club, or the shop with a particular brand, m and 21 million people, each doing one small thing a week. What a difference that can make. So at the moment, we believe there's 80% of our customer base in a positive frame of mind, even the recession, to drive change. Has a recession impacted it? Not at all. These small arrows at the bottom show what's happening in a recession. There's actually been a slight migration into this light green space from the cynical space. So what people are saying to us is, big business, it's down to you to take a lead. I'm going to do my bit, but don't try and pass the book to me in terms of carbon and all these other problems. When I see government and big business taking a lead, I'll join in and do my bit as well. So let's turn to carbon. I talked about 6.3 million tonnes of CO2 equivalent from the MS business model. 
half, well, it's a little over half a million. We've, we've recalibrated that now to 700,000 tonnes of um, CO2 equivalent from our own operation, 600 stores, 900 lorries. Supply chain, 4 million tonnes. Customer use of our products, 1.8 million tonnes. These are approximations. The Carbon Trust has been fantastic at helping us build that model up across that huge value chain, but that's broadly what it is. I actually think that no number will get bigger. As we begin to no learn more about how commodities are sourced for MS, the coffees, the teas, the cocos, the cottons, and the impact on, for example, on land change and deforestation, so those numbers will creep up. So it's not a small number that we have to get after. And let me just talk strategically about how we're beginning to tackle it. So let's take food. Carbon Trust, again, did some great work with us. They said, look, there's nine primary drivers for the carbon footprint of food, literally from the field to the fork to the consumer. We worked out the nine drivers. We then did what we call a heat map with them. And with this is basically those nine drivers broken down. And all that matters, if you're looking from the back of the room, is the area, the relative area of these boxes. Because what it's saying is the traditional bugbear about um, food, food miles, all this food you truck around Britain and you fly in, you bring around the world. At most, it's this thin line here. It's four or five percent of the carbon footprint of food in total. What matters is farming. This huge blob over here, 50 percent of the, the, the area there, is about raw material production, particularly meat and dairy. It's the diet that you and I consume that matters. Now, there's been quite a bit of debate from, you know, from Lord Stern downwards about meat consumption over the last couple of months, and that will only intensify. And we're working very, very hard with our farming base to start to tackle that and try to drive meat and dairy production on a different trajectory. So this, again, the Carbon Trust has helped us prioritise what really matters. I've got to make my lorries more efficient. I've got to minimise what I, I air freight. But really what I've got to get after is that farming base. So we've developed a systemic carbon plan to start to shrink that 6.3 million tonnes. It's about the farming, it's about the manufacturing, it's about logistics, how we ship things and move things around. It's about the stores, it's about our packaging, and it's about the use and disposal of our products at home. And let me just say a few brief words about each of those areas now. Our own operations, you've got to start there. Before you start asking other people, both customer and supplier, to do something, you've got to put your own house in order. Now, one of my challenges is that M&S store estate is very old. Some of those stores are 40, 50, 60, 70 years old. It's difficult to green them. But over the last three years, we've managed to drive an improvement in energy efficiency in the stores by 10% and in the lorries of 20%. Now, there's good co cost savings in there that we've done. M most things that we've done had a very rapid payback, 12 to 18 months at most. So again, start to put your own house in order. But again, that's halfway towards our targets. For stores, we want to become 25% efficient, efficient by 2012. I think we'll achieve it but it'd be tough, so we're about halfway there. Now, manufacturing. We started work with both food suppliers, and this is a clothing factory in Sri Lanka, where we're building, or helping them build unique demonstration facilities. This is a state-of-the-art clothing factory in Sri Lanka, producing lingerie for us. Carbon footprint, 50-60% less than normal. Waste footprint, 80-90% to 90 less. Water footprint, 50% less. Much better place for people to work. You start to take your other manufacturers in there and say, this is what it could look like. It's not about M&S just turning up from London and saying, change everything. Here's a real life example of things that have worked and some things that haven't. People can see it. Farming. I mentioned the need to get after farming. What you can't measure, you can't manage. Now, there's lots of standards out there to do with farming. You know, just do lots of activity farmers and let's hope things improve. What we're doing with the charity LEAF, Linking Environment and Farming, is actually to in develop a series of indicators to prove all that activity is making a difference. So around biodiversity, carbon, waste and water, we're actually beginning to measure with hundreds and eventually thousands of farmers what their systemic progress is each year to reduce their footprint. So that's about putting the baseline in place that we can measure success, success against. But then there's also got to look at opportunity. MS 20,000 farms. Well, here's just an example of how eight of them, um, I think it'd be put about 10 by now, are actually producing energy for us through a mix of anaerobic digestion, microhydro up in Scotland and wind up in Scotland. Farmers are doubling their income. The sellers meat, the sellers electricity as well. There's a lot of potential in terms of small scale distributed um, energy production around the, U the UK in the farming base. We're tapping into that with supporting farmers in terms of giving them long term contracts to buy. 
And then there's peer-to-peer -peer sharing. It's all very well, again, me turning up from London and saying, it's a great idea to tackle carbon, but farmers listen to farmers. And what we've been trying to do is bring the very best farmers together with the rest of the farming base to share best practice with them. This is 30 odd of our farmers out in Germany went to visit uh, a country with hundreds, if not thousands, of anaerobic digesters compared to our 20 or 30 here, talking to farmers who operate them in Germany. What's it like? You know, what are the practical problems of actually running them? Take the knowledge back and start to develop it at home. Again, opportunity. Climate change will bring change to the weather patterns in the UK. There are opportunities to start to grow different things here. We've been able to extend the strawberry season, the asparagus season. You know, I was, I was at an event this morning with the farming community where people were talking about champagne production in Kent. Things are changing. I wish it wasn't. I wish climate change wasn't happening, but where it is, let's make the most of it in terms of what farmers are able to produce here. So we talked about operations, we talked about manufacturing, we talked about farming. Let's go as far back away from m as you possibly can. Commodities. I use thousands, tens of thousands of tons of soya, of palm oil, of cotton, of coffee and tea that goes into my business model of cocoa, right at the very floor, as far from me as you can possibly get. That, to me, there is a huge impact, potentially, in terms of carbon. When it comes to deforestation, the amount of carbon that's locked up in the um, rainforest and peat bogs around the world and that is released by land change, driven by agricultural production, is huge. Now, we're number with a number of other retailers have committed to use 100% sustainable palm oil by 2015. Um, lots of people now work in that space. As an interim measure, we've committed to using 100% green palm certificates, which don't allow you to fully trace better um, palm oil, but pay a premium for what you do. So that goes back to producers to encourage uptake of sustainable palm oil. So again, you can go right back to the to the forest and start to make a difference in terms of carbon. Now, there's a few secondary wins in there as well in terms of, of raw materials. This is a story about polyester, oil-based. We want to move out of it, start to use recycled bottles. That's a good for avoiding waste. We use about 40 million bottle equivalents of recycled bottles to make fill for our sofas and cushions. But in avoiding oil, you've got a bit of a secondary carbon benefit. Not huge. You're probably ticking off another five, ten thousand 10,000 tonnes of carbon saved but you're starting just to t chip away at the problem by shifting your raw materials. Now let's move the other direction. Let's move to the customer. Uh, 1.8 million tonnes of CO2 equivalent, we estimate, much of which is driven by heating water to wash M&S clothing, 350 million garments a year. We encourage people to wash at 30 or lower. We can make a big difference in terms of carbon reduction. It's not just M&S playing in this space. People like Procter & Gamble with Aerial have done a very good job at encouraging people to wash at lower temperatures. You're starting to see the whole industry, the manufacturers of white goods, the powders, the clothing, converge on a story that says, really simple thing you can do at home, just wash at 30. That can make a big difference. I mentioned M&S Energy. It's a big growth potential for M&S going forward. This is the marketing we use with our customer. We're encouraging them to, to sign up to actually reduce the amount of energy they use. Now, other energy companies are probably beginning to talk in that space as well. But it's an interesting model about driving down consumption, but driving a profitable model for yourself as well. And we've got big aspirations for that in the future. And then the other part of consumers. Remember the 10% of green crusaders and the 35% the, the that are light green? They're increasingly saying to us, we want to have our voice heard, but we don't know how to do it. So what we do in the run-up to Copenhagen, we create a quilt on our website for people to put messages up to government leaders. He presented it to Joan Ruddock this morning down at Parliament to say, you know, we care. Now, towing the water, 1,500 people signed up to it this time. But the future, there's so much more we can do to drive customer engagement. You can make a difference through the M&S business model going forward to have your voice heard. Advertising, we, we launched a campaign last January, high to the recession, to tell people how they could save money from going green, doing the right thing. Encourage them to let, waste less food, wash at low temperatures, recycle the clothing with Oxfam, all of which, again, drives a carbon, indirect carbon message to people. Become more efficient, save yourself money. Again, a secondary story about, just like the polyester one, clothing recycling. We're driving the, the recycling of about three to four million garments of clothing each year with Oxfam, incentivising it with, with vouchers. That's great for avoiding waste. That, a lot of that clothing would have gone to landfill. Oxfam sell it, raise two million pound a year to spend in Africa. Good social message. Well, there's a secondary carbon message in there, there again, several thousand tonnes of CO2 avoided because we're driving a recycling model rather than people just buying new. So those are just a few examples of the 
systemic way that we're tackling carbon. But let me be absolutely clear. Marks and Spencer's here. Bottom of an Everest called building a sustainable business model. We've started to tick it off. We've started to understand the business benefits for us. We've started to apply models, practical models in the supply chain and with customers to tackle it. But we've got so much more to be done. I don't think any big business in the world is here, and certainly not there. What we need to do is work together, work with people like the Carbon Trust to unlock the solutions that we need. And my final point to you is, I don't think those solutions are necessarily about technology. You know, I'm really glad that the Carbon Trust is innovating, bringing new technologies to the marketplace, but the thing that really matters to me is culture. It's about behavior change. Millions of consumers, thousands of employees, thousands of suppliers, thinking, acting, and behaving in different ways, using the technologies and the processes that we have today to make the differences we need to achieve. And I've just put a few little time scales on there. 10 years to correct how we do business, but it's only 10 years away, 2020, to really start thinking fundamentally about changing our business model. Now, it might take 10, 15, 20 years to actually change it significantly, but you've got to start planning now. So final thoughts, you know, if you're going to tackle, start to build a low carbon business model, you've got to understand your value chain, carbon footprint. Don't measure it to the nth degree, you'll go mad. You'll go insane trying to measure it to the nth degree across every product. But we've got a shape out there. We know it's about refrigeration gases, we know it's about wash temperatures, we know it's about meat and dairy production. We can start to get after those big drivers of our footprint. You start to set tar targets to pick off those individual areas. You've got to build partnerships, both within your supply chain, in your value chain with your customers, uh, with your suppliers, with people like the Carbon Trust. You've got to use dem demonstration facilities to learn. The eco factories, the eco stores we've learned, we've learned a huge amount from just ramming all the possible improvements into one factory, one farm, one, one store. Third of it work overnight, brilliant. You roll it out across the rest of your store base, your factory base. Third will never work, there are car crash. And a third, you need a little bit more time to find out but you learn that in six months, not six years. See carbon reduction opportunities. Uh, you know, there's a degree of risk out there for all of us that we seem to be inactive. That's bad for your reputation. Uh, there's a potential impact upon your cost base. There's a potential competitive threat of competitors opening up marketplaces before you. But I spin that on the head. I believe that the next 10 years, certainly for Marks and Spencer, is all about opportunity. Huge opportunities from a low carbon business model. We've no divine right to reap those benefits before anybody else, also my competitors are doing very, very good stuff in this space, but I need to keep ahead of them. The business case is there. If you go back to the journey that we're on, I'll be bold. I think m and can get from here to the edge of there in pretty well a cost-neutral way. I'll have to invest tens, if not hundreds of millions of pounds, but they'll be offset by the similar order of magnitude of savings and new business opportunities. How much I have to invest here to create this? Don't know yet. Don't know. But certainly the next five to ten years of the journey, significant part of the start, can be done in a cost-neutral way. You've got to put it at the heart of the business. I mean, the most valuable thing that I've got at M&S, sports Stuart Rose as the chief exec, but is also the brand plan A. It allows us to link all these random disparate activities that mean something to me and to you, but to the people reducing packaging, changing polyester, working with farmers, the feel alone is just a random activity. Within the big tent of plan A, it becomes a very powerful change mechanism to say, again, together, we're making a real difference. And again, that point about radical change, as difficult it is to, to say today, we've got to start preparing for a very different kind of economy and businesses within it. m and has been hit by this recession as much as anybody else. Our profits have gone from a billion to 600 million. It's been a huge slump that we've had to deal with. Now, the business is on the way back now, but we've been through the mill just as much as anybody in this room, and yet we've still kept believing, we've still kept pressing. Good luck with your journeys. Thank you for listening. I'll take any questions. Thank you.